Thanks for checking out this review video. Uh, so I might look a little bit weird. I feel uncomfortable because this shirt is way too small for me. There's a re well, two reasons. Well, there's a main reason I'm wearing this shirt and it's too small for me. And there's a reason I don't care that it's too small for me. So this is a review for the film Shocker from 1989 by Wes Craven, written and directed by Wes Craven, by the, by the way. Um, so this is actually a Wes Craven uh, tribute shirt that I got in a, you know, one of those mystery boxes a long time ago. It never fit me, but I was like, hey, I still have it. I'm going to throw it on because tribute to Wes Craven, who was an awesome filmmaker, although Shocker is not an awesome film. The other thing is I put it on and I'm just like, this is way too small for me and it looks really weird and I look absurd. But guess what? Shocker is absurd. It is terribly absurd. So I'm going to look absurd for the review. It only fits. But as you can see, Horace Pinker from Shocker is on the shirt. So I figure... Here's my tribute to this. This movie's garbage, really. <laughs> I mean, it's garbage. The, I'm glad I saw it. This is the first time I've seen it, and I'm very much glad I saw it. Uh, but I won't watch it again unless I'm going to watch it with someone to be like, look at this piece of crap. There's a reason that when people talk about Wes Craven, they don't talk about Shocker. Here's why. And then you watch it. Uh, so uh, there will be spoilers going ahead, but if you're watching this and you um, haven't seen it yet, you can go back and watch it, uh, and then come back and, and see what I have to say, just to say you've seen Wes Craven's worst film ever, uh, but I, I can't really recommend the film, because it is, it, it just is, it is, <laughs> that's kind of all, how I can put it, okay, so I'm gonna give you some backstory on this, and then we'll get into it, this might go on for a while, because I'm gonna rant how bad this was, written and directed by Wes Craven, yes, this was after The Serpent and the Rainbow, which there's the coffin from it right there. And it was before the people under the stairs, which is, there's the dude from people under the stairs. Um, Craven said that the film was severely cut to meet the R rating. It was originally going to get an X rating from the MPAA and it was severely, severely cut. He ended up having to submit this film 13 separate times to the MPAA before he actually got that R rating. So, it's kind of mind-boggling for me to hear that it's it, it it was severely cut because of the fact that um, it feels way too long as it is. Like, it's an hour and 45 minutes, not really counting the credits, and um, it, it feels way too long. This movie is way too long for what it is, for what story is or is not actually there. Um, so I cannot imagine that this was severely cut. That would I I feel like it would have put it at, like, you know two hours or something, unless they just meant by severely cut as in just like very small snippets of just stuff that was super gory, which I know they had to, you know, cut out the super gory stuff, but I feel like they probably had to cut out a bunch extra just to make the story flow, which it actually doesn't <laughs> anyway. Cause that's the other thing I was like watching it early on and I'm just like, well, I wonder how much, how much it's the fault of the heavy, uh, of the heavy cutting in order to get that R rating that, that, how much of that is at fault for making it feel so kind of like disjointed and weird pacing wise. And then as I kept going with the film, I'm like, it's not due to that. It's just the film in general. Sorry. I have to readjust the neck like this. It's a schmedium man. It's, it's really choking me. I committed. I'm going for it. Um, so this film actually got a release on DVD in 2007 as a double feature with The People Under the Stairs. So that's kind of your watch a really good movie, watch a really bad movie. People Under the Stairs was really good. Uh, and I think Shocker was kind of supposed to be like The People Under the Stairs, where like there's comedy to it and there's social commentary to it, but it's also intense and thrillery and it's kind of scary and creepy. Uh, uh, they really didn't pull it off in Shocker. It was just too absurd, too over the top and stupid. They did pull it off with the people under the stairs. So that's kind of a good double feature in a sense. Uh, the other thing is if people want to see an in-depth film analysis of the people under the stairs, I did a video, uh, it's almost a year ago now for this channel, so, but you can go back and find it. I think I did a, quite a good job on that and toot my own horn. So the soundtrack for Shocker included Megadeth, Iggy Pop, and contributions from Paul Stanley from Kiss, Tommy Lee from Motley Crue, Rudy Sarzo from White Snake, and Michael Anthony from Van Halen. Right? You're just like, wow, okay. So the music was good. Like, the composition of the music, the composition of the soundtrack for the most part was good. 
it didn't fit the film though. There were so many weird moments in this film because of the matchup of what the scene was with the music. You're just like, this clashes. This doesn't make any sense. Prime example, the the cover of No More Mr. Nice Guy, who I think that was Iggy Pop who did that originally Alice Cooper song. And Alice Cooper shows up in the movie briefly at the end. Um, that cover of that song, No More Mr. Nice Guy, it's it's put to the scene where, you know, they're getting everything prepped for the electrocution of Horace Pinker, and it just doesn't fit. It just feels weird. You're like, this is supposed to be more of, like, a serious, somber moment where, like, this these people are going to get their revenge on this killer, and they're just like, No More Mr. Nice Guy, and it's all, like, teen boppy, like, pop almost, and it's like, this is, this is, you're killing the mood right here. You're killing the mood. I understand that with this film, they weren't, they obviously weren't going for serious. I think they should have gone for serious because it would have played better because the, the comedic stuff with it just didn't, didn't work. And I'll talk more about that coming up. But, uh, Mitch Pelegi is the guy who played Horace Pinker. Now, most people probably know him for his role as Skinner on the X-Files, which, Love the X-Files. Watch it when I was growing up. Love, love, love the X-Files. Uh, I want to go back and just watch through that whole thing. So anyway, he was... There were moments in this film where he did a really good job with the role, but then there were moments where he was like crazy, absurdly over the top. But I kind of feel like that's what was asked for at those moments because the whole movie felt that way. Um, overall, the acting in this was terrible. Just bad acting. Pelegi, I think, um, could have turned in a very good performance if it was supposed to be a serious role, and so I kind of feel bad for him in this in this film because he's just absurd in this, and I don't think it's his fault. Uh, it's a small role, but I like the fact that Ted Raimi shows up in this one. Gotta love some Ted Raimi. Quite like that guy. Uh, all the news clips in the beginning of this film uh, drives home the violence of society and how it's exploited on the news. That was kind of my thought when they're, you know, starting the whole film out with just showing all these clips of like war and, and, you know, people rioting and fighting each other in the streets and stuff like that. I was just like, Oh, I feel like this film's going to kind of have a theme of societal violence and the way it's portrayed on TV, specifically the news. And it kind of did, but I'll talk more about that at the very end of the video when I'm going to give you what I really think my, my idea is on what they were trying to, to nail home with this film. Poorly, but what they were trying to do. Uh, the amount of slapstick humor that this film started with, you know, when Jonathan is playing football and he, like, runs into the goalposts and there was, like, a bunch of slapsticky stuff and he's, like, falling over things and people are making jokes. All that slapsticky humor and, well, and the humor in general in this film, so cringy. Just the cringiest, most terrible comedy. It was... Ugh. The film felt like, I'm sorry, I spit. I don't know if you saw that. That's how enraged this film has me. The film felt like it didn't know which way it wanted to go. Like, like Craven had an idea of like, you know, I'd really like it to be kind of serious, but I'd also really like it to be just like fun and humorous. And it's like he just kept fighting, having that fight in his brain while they were making the movie and just kind of like winging the, uh, the kind of, attitude of the film in general so that's why it just feels so like conflicted all the time and you're just like what are you trying to do are you trying to scare me right now is this supposed to be serious are we supposed to be creeped out is this supposed to be thrilling or is this supposed to be dumb and over the top and stupid and funny i don't know <laughs> it's so confusing uh i feel like it got too weird too early i wrote down uh there should have been a lot more backstory in the beginning yeah they could just kind of like throw you into things with the weirdness and the fact that jonathan somehow through hitting his head like he can uh connect with this serial killer just because he hit his head i don't know what the idea behind that is and then because of that he starts having all these crazy dreams which feels unbelievably reminiscent of a nightmare on elm street they were pulling way too much from nightmare on elm street on this and they should have left that alone i think all the dream slash nightmare stuff totally did not fit in this film it those were actually some of the worst parts because it really slowed the pace down a lot because it's like, this doesn't really have a whole lot to do with what's going on with Horace Pinker. Why don't we focus on that? Cause that's the story. 
it felt like they wanted to be like, oh man, we got to do this callback to Nightmare on Elm Street. We really want to use dream sequences and stuff. But it just took away. It didn't add anything. And it was boring and stupid and felt overused, especially because there had been plenty of Nightmare on Elm Street films by, by this time. So people have had enough. They've seen enough of it, you guys. Let's not. Um... That dude's using an insane amount of electricity with all those TVs on, I wrote down. Uh, at that point, I didn't know his name was Horace Pinker, but yeah, at, at his like hideout or whatever, or like voodoo house, because that's another thing, he was using voodoo, so I felt like they just tried to cram in a lot of stuff into this. Like when they the cops show up and he says like all these TVs on, and I was just like, he's drawing a lot of electricity, which, you know, I understand that that's like, kind of the point of shocker that all the all about the electricity with it but um that guy would would have a huge huge energy bill that was just something i thought was funny um so the part where they actually go in there and they infiltrate it and the one the one cop disappears because pinker like grabbed him with the trap door thing and then he's gone and jonathan says to his dad he's like wasn't one of your guys just here and he goes how the hell should i know I was like, are you kidding me? You are leading this operation as the head of, I think, I guess he's like a sheriff or like the head of police or whatever. So he's leading the operation. He brings the police officer in, officers in there against their will, might I add, because at first they're just like, isn't this illegal? We shouldn't be doing this. And he's like, no, it's fine. I just made something up on the fly. Let's go in. And, and then, and then he's just like, how am I supposed to know where these people are? I'm not responsible for anyone. It, doesn't make sense. The dialogue in this film is terrible. The dialogue's terrible. The jokes are even worse. It's bad. Like, that's just a, a big example right there. It was one of the first glaring examples of terrible dialogue in the film. But I have a few more as I go on. Another quote from the father. You stay out of this. This is my business. Police business. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Thanks for clarifying that your business is police business, which we knew because we were there when you broke in as a police officer with your other police, but then you just forgot what the mission was because you're like, why am I, am I supposed to be paying attention? Why am I supposed to know where everyone is? Woo. Uh, I already wrote, yeah, I wrote down, I kind of covered this. It feels a lot like a nightmare on Elm Street and it was too much. It was too heavy on that. In my opinion, they should have left that totally alone. Wes Craven, Jesus, man. I mean, R.I.P. Wes Craven. He made some amazing stuff. Everyone's going to have a stinker when they make as much as he does, or he did. So, you know, you can forgive this, but when you watch the film, you're just like, how? Like, how, how did we end up here? Um, okay, this is this was another funny thing. There are a lot of these moments just like, this makes no sense, this makes absolutely no sense, this makes absolutely no sense. When Jonathan's uh, girlfriend gets murdered, but he's at football practice, and then the coach says to him, you need to go home. You need to go home. Why would the coach tell him to go home, which he knows is a active crime scene where the kid's girlfriend got murdered? Does that make any sense? Hey, go to this active crime scene. See your murdered girlfriend. That's a great idea, coach. <laughs> Uh, I wrote down movie feels disjointed and also rushed, but also slow at the same time. At different times, it feels different ways. Throughout, it feels pretty disjointed. It feels very slow at times, like they're trying to kill time. And at other times, it feels like they're trying to be like, let's go, let's go, let's go. So it's just weird. It's like, stop, go, stop, go. I'm sorry. Also, I'm sorry for my energy level on this one. I'm pretty amped up. Like when I see movies, it's just like, drive me nuts or I really hate or piss me off like I get even more animated and, and reactive um yeah I wrote down the set I kind of touched on this but the soundtrack makes the movie feel like a joke and I put that down when I when that scene came up I was talking about where it was supposed to be the prep for the execution uh but that persisted that issue um then here was a question with that when they were getting ready for him to be executed and he did his voodoo ritual in his cell. How did he get all of his voodoo stuff? Because I'm pretty sure when you're arrested, you do not they don't give you the time and say, oh, go back in your place and grab all the stuff you want to take with you, you know, to make yourself feel at more at home. 
How did he get all that crap? Totally doesn't make sense. Just another one of these moments. Sorry, I got a hair on this. Uh, the law inform enforcement in this movie gives zero shits when people die. Yes, 100%. Other people kind of care when people end up dead in, in this, but when anyone in law enforcement sees that someone got killed, they're just like, eh. And they just move past them. Like, throughout the entire film, they're just like, Bleh, don't care. That was just weird. Uh, the body bursting into flames was actually a very cool thing. After the, uh, the attempted execution, see my cat is mad about this film too. Actually, she, she slept through it. But, um, yeah, the body bursting into flames, so I guess it's like the body that Horace Pinker doesn't need anymore because he's jumping bodies at this point. When it bursts into flames and just, like, immolates totally, that, that was actually a cool effect. I liked it. Um, I like how Horace in the cop's body can't hit anything with his pistol when he's running after Jonathan. He's just shooting, shooting, shooting. And Jonathan's like, I don't know, is he that good? Are we supposed to assume that he's that great at football and running routes that he can dodge bullets that way. Cause it kind of feels like it because he shoots so many bullets at him, can't hit him. And then the random guy shows up. He shoots one bullet at that guy and nails him in the back exactly where he needed it to. So it's just like another thing that makes absolutely no sense. Um, my favorite part of this movie actually may have been when Horace jumped into the little girl's body because seeing the little girl say the word fucker <laughs> was very, very funny. And then just just the way she acted, too. Like, when she was trying to run and drag her foot at the same time, it was hilarious. That, by far, is my favorite segment of the film. It's great. That little, that little girl did a great job. I just got to give her credit. I don't know her name, but she did a great job. Uh, why the hell do people just believe what this kid is telling them? It's totally not believable. Throughout this film, Jonathan is going to these people on it. Uh, his football members, his girlfriend, his father, The um, although the father doesn't really believe him, but all these other people, including the, the football coach, just believe him when he tells him this crazy story. Hey, there's this serial killer who travels through electricity and is jumping into other people's bodies. And they're just like, oh, okay. How can we help you? What? It makes absolutely no sense. Another moment in this film that makes no sense. I just, I don't understand what was going on in Wes Craven's mind when he wrote the script. And then when he made the film, you have time between when you write the script, when you get a final edit, and when you start making the film, you can change this stuff. It was a terrible idea. Terrible idea. Ah. Uh, Sorry, I got to calm down a little bit. Uh, when Horace plugged into the socket towards the end, well, towards the false end, I was like, oh, man, maybe it's going to be over here. And he, like, plugged his fingers in the socket, which I will say the the effect of, like, his fingers elongating and becoming, like, the prongs and going in, that was cool. Uh, but when that happened, I was like, no, don't prolong this movie. Can we just end it here, please? Oh, it killed me, man. I was so unhappy. Uh so I wrote down specifically the film drags horribly after the, the TV tower scene where, you know, Horace gets into uh, the father's body and they scale that TV tower and he's about to fall and everything. Um, after that, it gets really, really, really slow and drags horribly, which is the moment where you want to maintain momentum because you're coming into the end. I feel like that's within the last maybe even 20 minutes of the film. You got to keep going at that point, but it gets crazy slow. Uh, all the dream world stuff is stupid and weighs the movie down. doesn't even fit the story. I already talked about that. The chair fight scene was kind of funny at first, but then I, it, it kept going and I was like, this is actually just really bad. And I don't understand why anyone comes up with this concept in the first place. It was like, we can make this work. Um, yeah, where the Barca lounger just, he becomes it. And then he's sitting in his lap at one point. It's just, it's weird. It looks bad, and it doesn't work. So they, there couldn't there couldn't have been a more absurd scene than Jonathan and Horace fighting inside the TV. Uh, that, at the moment, I felt like they wanted it to be very over the top, but it was too over the top, and it just made it very comical and dumb, and it just didn't work. I don't know. When they just kept going through all the scenes, like, there's an A-bomb going off. They're going through World War II. They're going through, you know, people riding in the streets. Just... That, that whole fight scene, and it looked bad. And that's one of the things, it's like, 
older films that focus on technology and like TV and electricity and all that type of stuff, it's never going to hold up because the special effects will always look bad in about, you know, five to 10 years. It's already going to look bad. And then it just gets worse, 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 worse. You know, I know they're not, when they make these films, they're not planning for, well, what's it going to look like in 20 years? They're planning for, can we make money in the box office right now? And this movie definitely, you can tell that was the focus of this. It's like, it's Wes Craven, put it in the theater. Let's see if we get some money out of it. So when did a remote control become a Wii controller before Wii controllers even existed? Because he's just like taking the remote when he was controlling Horace with it and just like whipping him around the room. And I'm like, that doesn't work. Like, I get the premise of him hitting the freeze frame and it stopped him. Okay, you got me on that one. But there's no button for, like, move across room, move up to ceiling. Like, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Another thing that doesn't make sense. They must have had a lot of fun shooting fight scenes in this because there are so many prolonged fist fight scenes in this film. It's gratuitous. It's like people wanted to be kind of like they live, but not just do, like, one super long scene. They wanted to do a bunch of of medium length fist fights uh the premise doesn't work <laughs> guy has a link with a killer because he hits his head i put i don't get it how is it that he gets this link with this killer just because he had a concussion makes no sense the dialogue is terrible I already said that the acting is terrible I already said that special effects don't hold up at all I already said that but all those things bear repeating so that's why i said it again uh, it's easy to see why people don't talk about this movie when it comes to Wes Craven. I'm sure Wes Craven wanted to forget about this film. But look, I got it on a t-shirt, so it's not going away. Horace Pinker forever. I'm going to keep this t-shirt now. Because there's a lot of awesome on here and one terrible. Um, for what little substance this film has, it goes on way too long. And this was severely cut. I already said this, but once again, I got to say that. So the last thing I'm going to say is this, this, this is my end feeling on kind of the theme they were going for tying into the TV and violence and society and all that. So I wrote, was the whole point of this film to say that kids will take responsibility for themselves and not emulate violence for TV? Because I know this, this was kind of in, in the realm of the time period where um, a lot of politicians were trying to blame violence on you know, TV, movies, video games, all that. Well, it was, they didn't hit video games at this point yet, but they did that later. There, there's this whole cycle of those types of things happening where it's like, oh, these kids with their music and their TV and it's making them all violent. So I, I know that was going on during this time. So I don't know if this is kind of supposed to be Wes Craven's commentary in the end of, look, Kids will see this stuff, they'll take it in, they'll struggle with it a little bit, but in the end, they're going to be their own parent, they're going to be an adult, and they're going to take responsibility for being themselves and reasoning through these things and not acting on what's what's coming from the television. Chloe, can you be quiet, please? I'm sorry, she's very worked up about this. So anyway, um, yeah, so put, your, put some comments down here, let me know, do you think that was kind of the, the idea behind the whole theme of this film or what? And, um, yeah, just give me your thoughts overall. I, this movie's so bad. Like I said, I can't recommend it, but I might show it to someone to be like, you want to see some real garbage? Because I like to do, do that thing, like subject people to terrible movies from time to time. It's kind of funny. Um, but, but once again, I'm glad I saw this because I can say I've seen more of Wes Craven's movies. I haven't seen everything. I've seen a lot of it though. Um, and at some point I will, will like to say I've seen it all and, then I'll forget about Shocker at that point because <laughs> everything will be complete. Anyway, my star rating for this uh, with five stars in play, half stars being able to be used, it's a one star film. And the reason it even makes one star, uh, half star is the lowest I can I can go on this. I'm, I don't do zeros. The reason it makes it up to a one star is because there is some stuff that actually is funny in it. And there were a few things that I kind of liked, like the girl little girl being possessed by Horace Pinker. So there were a few things I enjoyed and there was some entertainment factor to the film, but overall, ugh, gosh. So anyway, thanks everyone for checking this out. Please do me a solid real quick. Pay me back for watching this terrible movie by hitting that subscribe. I would appreciate that very much. Put some comments down there about this. You can do a like if you want to, but in the end, it doesn't matter except doing that subscribe because that's what I need. But thank you so much for checking this out. Until next time, keep it brutal.